G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give a big shout out to Canva for sponsoring this episode. So, I'm certainly not an expert when it comes to design. In fact, I would say I'm very much a beginner. But recently, I wanted to put together family photos and work on something special for my family. Doing this proved challenging at first, from resizing things to trying to get all of the tones and the shading just right. It was really challenging to say the least. That is, until I found Canva. Canva Pro is the easy to use design platform that has everything you need to design like a pro. Whether you're a professional designer or just getting started like me, Canva Pro can help boost you and your team's productivity and creativity. It's a quick, easy, and affordable way to design whatever you need. No matter what you're creating and sharing, Canva Pro has everything you need in one place, including a collection of over 75 million premium photos, videos, audio, and graphics. Plus, Canva Pro comes with time-saving tools that simplify and speed up the creative process. You get all of this and more in just one Canva Pro subscription. My favorite Canva Pro feature is actually the resizing feature. Most of the time doing the sizing is super frustrating and really time consuming because you have to convert inches into pixel measurements or centimeters into inches, do all the math and then ensure everything fits just right. But with Canva Pro, they have this great little feature that just instantly resizes things for you so you can get back to focusing on improving your project. This was especially useful for resizing lots of photos like I did. But there's no idea too big or too small for Canva Pro. Whether you're a student working on some projects, interested in upping your social media game, or want to do more personal projects like me, Canva has everything you need. So, design like a pro with Canva Pro. And right now you can get a free 45-day extended trial when you use my promo code. Just go to canva.me slash scared to get your free 45-day extended trial. That's c-a-n-v-a dot m-e slash scared. Canva.me slash scared. So this encounter happened many years ago and I was very young at the time. It was in 2001 or 2002 and uh, I was 11 or 12. My uncle was interested in purchasing some land near Red Oak, Oklahoma. I don't know exactly where but it was several acres in a very remote area. My father, mother and myself, we all decided to accompany him one Saturday to just scope out the property. From our home it was a little more than a three hour drive but we all love riding in the car, so while it was not going to be the most eventful road trip, we went just to get out of the house. Upon arrival, I remember being very underwhelmed by the place. No houses were anywhere near the place, and hardly even any signs of life at all apart from like a few birds, and the wooded area wasn't exactly what I would call picturesque or anything. Still though, we parked our car off the road to go explore the woods a little. My uncle was talking about buying the land for hunting, but not really my cup of tea. As we walked through the woods, it was a pretty nice day, but still, something just felt off. Everyone in our group remarked about the eerie feeling, but my dad and uncle seemed to laugh it off. My mum had goosebumps and kept looking over her shoulder, which made me on edge too. She was very insistent though that it was weird and she wanted to leave, saying it felt like she was being watched. After a bit of hiking, I noticed that there was a small red building. I've seen bigger storage sheds in the suburbs, but it looked really well built. My uncle said that there was nothing about it on the listing, so we went to peek inside. The door was open, and inside there were open cans of food, a ruddy blanket on the floor, and it stunk unlike anything I'd ever smelt before. Following this discovery though, we all agreed that it would be best to get back to the car if there was some crazy hermit living in the woods we didn't want to be around to find him. The only issue was that we had walked pretty far into the woods and now weren't exactly sure which direction was correct. But the eerie feeling really amped up at this point and we were all on edge. 
Uh, we ended up trekking another mile before we finally found the road, but we were further down from where we had parked the car, but at least we could just follow the road now. Walking along the road, though, we came across a, a truly unsettling sight. Right in the middle of the asphalt was a dark grey cat that had been set on fire. I have no idea why a cat was out in the middle of nowhere or how it came to be killed and set alight like that. Obviously, though, this had just happened, but there was nobody in sight. Naturally, we ran the rest of the way to the car, and when we got there, there was a huge scratch in the paint all down the side of it from the hood to the trunk. Thankfully, it was the only damage and my dad was able to start it without any trouble and we just drove away as fast as we possibly could. My heart is sped up just recounting this moment. Definitely one of the scariest of my life. Needless to say though, my uncle did not buy the land. And I'll always remember this terrifying encounter, but like anything over time, I sort of pushed it to the back of my mind and it just became one of those odd moments you occasionally retell at a family get-together years later. So much that it's almost a bit of a funny story now. The reason why I'm sharing this though is because I was actually reminded of it last night while binge-watching some episodes of BuzzFeed Unsolved on YouTube when they shared the story of a family that disappeared in that same area while also looking at some land for sale. The disappearance of the Jamison family is the name of the mystery in the video if you're interested. And the family allegedly died in the same area that we were searching roughly seven years after we made our trip there. There are some theories about their deaths including the allegations of some sort of cult in the area, complete with something even about dead cats. Coincidence? Probably, but the whole story gave me chills. So, if my family narrowly avoided being killed by some witches or a cult or whatever, or if we just stumbled upon a hermit who didn't want us in the woods, I'm just glad that we got out in one piece. So I take my dad's ashes up to Glacier National Park every year. I lived in Colorado when this story happened, and I was headed south through Idaho after I had visited Montana. My car broke down in Idaho, and a nice man helped me out. I was headed through the mountains to Boise to visit a friend. It was a five-hour drive before I entered the truly mountainous section of Idaho, and I saw a hot spring on the side of this two-lane highway along the Salmon River. I decided to take a dip after the stress of having my car breaking down. The hot spring had a bathhouse up at the top near the road and a wheelchair ramp that went down to the area near the springs where they were on the side of the river. The people had created little sort of bath-shaped sections in the river that were separated by river stones. Actually, you could sit in a spot that was shaped like a hot tub so that it held the water from the hot springs while the river rushed over it. I got out of my car in any case and headed down to the hot spring. I took my dog with me. It was twilight, about every half an hour a car passed by. Knowing that I was alone, essentially, I took off my top. I was sitting in the hot spring and actually took a photo of a car approaching. The car pulled up next to mine in front of the bathhouse. It was a truck with three men in it. Seamlessly, too, one man got out of the driver's side and two men got out of the passenger side. They moved without qualms and were covered in sort of heavy black gear. They looked like hunters, maybe, but I couldn't see the expressions on their faces. The driver headed down the wheelchair ramp towards me, not hesitating. He took big, long strides. I recognized that there was danger in this. The two passengers from the other side of the car headed down the steep bank along the wheelchair ramp, taking a shortcut. I was now stuck in between both parties. Hastening, I hid and dressed myself under water while my dog growled. He never growls, mind you. I've only ever heard him growl like all of twice in my life, and this was the second time. The driver kept walking towards me. He walked onto the rocks in the river too, continuously walking towards me, even though he was covered in heavy gear that if he actually fell in, he would be super waterlogged. The other two passengers from the side of the car were also walking on the rocks, directly in front of me now. 
The driver got so close that I had to grab my dog before he lashed out at the driver. I was freaking out, obviously. The man was walking out onto the stone so he could reach me, and he was not hesitating one bit. Still, though, I couldn't see his face, but I grabbed my phone, my keys, and my clothes. I dragged my dog in between the two parties. My heart is in my ears. The driver would not stop, and he turned around very quickly making an arc, coming for me still. He was still taking big strides as well, and the passengers were walking towards me as well. I was trapped in between them, and... In the end, I had to run up the bank dragging my dog pretty much by his collar all the way into my car. And the only way that I could get into my car without them grabbing me was by throwing my dog into the back and lunging myself into the passenger side door of my car. I threw my keys into the ignition and turned them right when the men were walking up between my car and their car. I happened to hit the lock button on the door right when they walked up and before anything else happened or before I saw their faces... I ended up throwing myself into the driver's seat, reversing my car, and hightailing it right out of there. I drove about 20 minutes down the road, I crossed the river on the bridge, and I hid my car behind a bank near other campers. It was well hidden from the main road. The campers were looking at me wondering what was going on, and I sat and I waited. Another 10 minutes passed by, and lo and behold, the truck drove by. There was no doubt in my mind that the hunters, they were looking for me and I managed to wait another half an hour and then drove up to the mountains, over to boys and into safety. My parents moved from Ireland to Middle England in the early 90s, into a house that was built in the early 1900s. It's a pretty Georgian, semi-detached, and next door, which used to be part of the garden, an older couple lived who came very close to my family and were basically our grandparents. The woman, M, grew up in our house, and they built their house in what was once the garden and ours to look after their aging mother and mother-in-law. M's mother was a wealthy woman. They had live-in maids and would have been quite upper class back in the day. But unfortunately, her children were all ailing in some way. Her eldest boy died at four and M had diabetes. In fact, she was one of the first people to receive insulin, which saved her life in her late teens. And the youngest boy was very disabled, physically challenging and nonverbal. My granddad, Jay, thought that he may have had some sort of a locked-in syndrome with quite a lot of intellectual gifts beneath an inability to communicate and mental illness too. By the way, I lost my granddad last year. M died many years ago. He was my best friend and a soulmate. A war veteran at 101 died alone due to COVID, which was just really unfair. I'd love anyone listening to this to spare a thought for his memory, as he was the most awesome dude that I'd ever met. I have so many stories from him and his century-long life. If anyone wants me to start to separate a, another story about that, I would love to do it. But anyway... In 2011, after working far too hard in my early 20s and my first job after university, college for my transatlantic cousins, I felt totally burnt out to be honest. Six years of intense higher level schooling and then a 60 hour work week. Ah. So I moved back for a bit just to take a breather whilst finding another job. Three weeks in of my being there, the disabled brother, granddad Jay's brother-in-law, Unfortunately, he died. He would have been in his 90s. In 2011, too, it began within days of Jay's brother-in-law's death. But first of all, just a kind of, I don't know, an eerie feeling as if I was being watched. I wondered if I'd developed some kind of anxiety problem, as I had suffered panic attacks for a brief spell in my teens. Then, scratching. We'd never had a bird or a mouse problem before, so I asked my parents. My dad was so often working away, to be honest, but he was there sometimes. I asked them if we should have pest control come over and check the walls of the house. They said that it had only been quite recently, so we should wait for a while. Maybe it was some roosting pigeons nestling the last weeks of their fledglings or something like that. But then a kind of tapping or rapping sound started. Almost like someone was gently knocking from within the bricks of the house. I became so used to the strange sounds too around me that 
I lost all interest in trying to find the source. Usually, taps, knocks, and bangs were all accounted for. I presumed maybe old pipes had become unsecured or next door had rats. But I also ignored the fact that we lived in the house for 20 years and had none of these problems before. One morning, though, I woke up with a, a bit of a start. It was dusk, about 5am. The old TV that had sat abandoned for six years in the corner of my brother's old room where I was sleeping was now clicking madly. The walls were scratching. The knocking, even though the heating was off and it was summer so no pipes could have been causing it, was just in a frenzy. I stared around for a few seconds, completely in terror and shock, and realized almost instantly that this... this was paranormal energy. When I say the energy was frenzied, I mean it too. It was like a, a quietish cacophony. I filmed it on my old phone, in fact, and have it on my laptop somewhere. And when people say that you can't film this stuff, yes, you can. I know nothing about the paranormal. In fact, I used to laugh at horror films. So why would it come into my head so strongly and completely that this was what it was? I found that really strange. This went on for days though and I even mentioned it to my mum. She laughed it off. My mum is an accountant and super intelligent and a practical person. She is where unnecessary drama goes to die to be honest. But I googled it and I found an article. And what was creepy about it and scares me to this day was that it was textbook what was happening to me. The scratches, the tappings, how it seemed to be getting louder and how the sounds began to feel intentional, like three obvious knocks rather than just tapping, really human. Also that I never felt fear like it. I could have a wonderful evening laughing with friends. They go home, I'd go to bed feeling warm and wonderful, and then I awoke. Unlike ever before in my life, somewhere between like 3am and 5am too with the most unbelievable sense of dread that frankly did not feel like it came from me. I mean, I did not feel like the source of it or anything. And then the nightmares came. I felt like the more that I thought about it, the more it fed off my energy or something. Like there was a legit psychological level to all of this. That was the worst part of all of it too. The nightmares, they were always the same as well. I woke up, only I couldn't move. Sleep paralysis, I guess. And there was a dark presence in the room, sometimes in the form of a shadow in the corner, a large male shadow and the most ominous feeling that I've ever felt. Terror and danger unlike anything that I could ever have imagined. I had never and have never had nightmares before or since this too, Maybe the odd small one, but I don't really get them. What I mean is that I haven't had any experience like it since, actually. Typing about it even spooks me out because I feel like the energy you let out is whatever this thing fed on. Despite this, though, I just chalked it up to anxiety and told my mum that I was no longer sleeping in that room and she said that she would swap. So I chose to go on the sofa instead. The next few days were fine and peaceful, too. Until mum came down one morning completely ashen faced. I asked if she was okay and she described getting sleep paralysis even though she didn't know what it was for the first time in her life may I add and described well my experience the male shadow figure I had never told her about this by the way in that same corner with the same feeling Jay's brother-in-law was over six foot, by the way, and he was an angry, tortured soul. And that room, it was M's old room. She also had the classic incubus thing. I didn't have that, thankfully, but when I told her to Google it and it was a real thing, she was horrified how similar her experiences were to others, because she had never heard this either. Things got worse from there, too. Whatever this was grew angrier and angrier and every night just as you were about to drift into sleep, literally that second of losing consciousness, there would be a huge bang on the bed's headboard like the whole strength of an incredibly strong man wrenching you from sleep. It was happening in every room now too. It was at this time that we started to get insomnia. Not sleeping for the best part of like three months is well, terrible let me tell you. 
Uh, I was getting really fed up though and was just a nervous wreck and it was at this point that I decided to move out. But before I did, I called a carbon monoxide person to check for leaks and there wasn't any. A week before I moved out, things started happening in the day and even my father, who would angrily shut it all down repeatedly, he's more stubborn than an ocean of mules and hates anything remotely dramatic or whimsical, He's a working class Irishman scientist through and through and deeply resents the magical thinking of the Catholic stuff. He was brought up with it. But even he agreed to finally get some spiritual help. Maybe even a priest. The night that we decided on that too, I woke up with one of the huge bangs. Only to find books on my floor. I finally had evidence to show my parents and they couldn't deny that. I didn't throw them. I couldn't have in fact. I didn't even leave my bed. I just screamed and they came in and they would have heard if I had left my bed. Those last few days included audible growls at some points. I even recorded a few. Incredibly strong smells of male sweat mixed with some kind of ammonia. And my sister, she was visiting and I, running and screaming almost over to the neighbor's house because I was explaining how the knocks were intentional, like sometimes one, two, three. And as soon as I finished saying that, three there were. Three very loud, intentional knocks on the door right next to us. Also, my name was whispered so many times. Whatever this was wanted us to know that it was hearing us. My mum said that she was also pushed across the landing against the wall in the middle of the day at one point. But in any case, I left. Mum went to church for the first time in like 20 years. She only went a few times, but she said that it helped. I came back to visit three months later. One morning when I heard my mum come down for breakfast, I turned to her and we both said, it's gone, at the same time. Like I said, I've never had any experience before or since like this, me or anyone in my family too. Never had any bad nightmares in the 10 years since. I now have this theory too that humans are monumentally egotistical when it comes to thinking that the universe begins and ends within the realms of our limited five senses. It's not completely unfeasible to think that there are sentient beings or entities or maybe even animals we cannot easily detect. So, do I believe? Oh... No, not resolutely, because it was only one period of time in my life and it was fairly short and contained. But do I now keep a very open mind where I once laughed it all off? Absolutely. But my dad denied it ever happened, but uh, mum and I, we aren't so foolish. Lastly, please feel free to ask me any questions too. There's so much I haven't said and it happened like over 10 years ago so there's a lot I've forgotten I would guess and will probably remember if prompted. Also, my fingers hurt and I want to stop for now. I just want to send some love and some peace to all of you guys as well after such a difficult global pandemic and I hope this story doesn't upset anyone. That's not my intention. It's more for an open discussion and to just get it off my chest. For anyone who may be scared though, I moved back to this house four years later and I'm still here and it remains one of the most lovely and homely feeling places ever. Obviously, I'm a little bit biased though. I guess what I'm just trying to say is that I've never experienced anything like it since. And I guess you could say that nothing is bad forever. So when I was about 11, maybe 12, my family and I moved out to the middle of some abandoned strip mines in rural Alabama. And let me tell you, it was awesome. Going swimming in the quarries, lots of abandoned equipment and cliff faces to climb, caves and miles and miles of trails, abandoned dirt roads used by the mines too, and all of it we could explore. The trade-off though was there were a lot of venomous snakes, and at night, it got really dark real quick. There were no street lights, just the occasional porch light maybe every mile or so on the main road. But we loved it because of all the freedom that we had. 
One day in particular though, my friend P and I were out on one of the dirt roads that went off to the side of the main road. We hadn't been down that road before, but it was like 10am on a bright summer day and we figured why not. We had gone maybe a, a mile down that road and came to a left hand turn eventually. And beside that left hand turn and alongside that road that we were walking on was a sort of small lake. We walked up to this lake and were watching small frogs and a turtle swimming around when I caught movement across the lake. I saw a man walking away from us, heading up the hill. I poked P and pointed, Who's that? Why is he out here? We were miles into the mines at this point, no people anywhere, no houses nearby and we both stood up. As soon as we got right on our feet too, he stopped walking and in a split second, he just spun around and came running in our direction. We bolted, and I mean we ran, like Gump. I looked back and he was running faster than any human that I'd ever seen though. He covered the distance. He had to run down the hill and around the lake to get close to us. That route was easily 300 yards, but he got to us in seconds. P grabbed me and we jumped off the road and into a ditch behind some bushes. I peeked out and... He was maybe 30 or 40 inches from us, spinning around in the road, making this awful grunting sound. And weirdly enough, I swear he had an entire cooked chicken in his hand. He was wearing destroyed overalls, dirty boots, and he had what I can only describe as a Cro-Magnon brow. Huge. My memory might not be super accurate given how long it's been, but it seemed like his forehead stuck out a good 4 inches over his eyes too. He was the, the scariest thing that I'd ever seen. He just spun around in the road and started running back the way that he came too. We just stayed there in that ditch for almost an hour, I think, afraid to move, listening and watching in case he was hiding and waiting for us. Eventually, we crawled along the roadside all the way back to the main road. From there, we walked but stayed in the tree line until we saw the main paved road and then when we got there, we just ran, ran all the way back home, got home, told our fathers and both of our fathers and P's older brothers loaded up and went looking for him but never found a thing. All these years later and it still haunts me what I saw that day. Oh and uh, my girlfriend recently took me out to her grandmother's house to meet and spend time with her family and where does her dear old granny live? Yeah, you guessed it right on the edge of those same strip mines. I told her the story and she looked really serious at me and said, you guys are really lucky. There's all kinds of bad things that happen in those mines. So yeah, every visit to grandma means the Glock and the 12 gauge ride with us. And that was the creepiest encounter that I've ever had. When I was 8 years old, my family moved from my original childhood home in a 120 year old house with a lot of history. It was a beautiful house but there had been a big fire in it many years ago and it was abandoned for like 15 years. I really didn't like the house when we first moved. The energy just felt off and I felt like I was constantly being watched. There were certain rooms where the energy felt so off that I refused to go in there alone. But we also ended up moving my bedroom after one or two years because I hated the energy in the room and just couldn't explain it to anyone. My parents wrote these feelings off as just being a scared eight year old. But the feelings about specific rooms maintained until we moved out when I was 18. A lot of strange occurrences happened during the 10 years that I lived in this house. So much so that in high school, I started to wonder if I could be schizophrenic. Even though these occurrences happened exclusively at home and since moving I haven't experienced anything. I was constantly seeing things out of the corner of my eye or hearing footsteps when I was home alone but I'm going to share two experiences that really stand out in my memory. So for my 13th or 14th birthday I had a few girlfriends sleep over in the living room. Some of them had never been to my house before and I didn't tell them anything about it because I just wanted everyone to have a good time and not feel spooked. 
At the next morning though, one friend asked why my dad was walking between our sleeping bags for a while last night. I immediately knew that that wasn't my dad. My parents went up to bed while we were still awake and my dad confirmed that he didn't get up in the night. My friend though didn't particularly want to sleep over after that first night and to be honest, I couldn't blame her. Another experience that I vividly remember happened when I was coming home from a party in high school one day. It was after midnight, but I was definitely sober because I drove that night. I was entering the back door that was in the backyard and opened into the kitchen, but we never used the front door of our house. And as I was putting my key in the door, I looked through the glass pane on the door. The view went straight through to the kitchen and into the hallway near the front of the house. And at one side of the hallway wall, in view, was a full-length mirror hanging up, and in the brief few seconds that I was looking through the glass on the door, I saw a very distinct, solid-looking figure run out of the mirror. I know that this is going to sound weird, but it looks like it was in the position that sprinters are in when they sort of crouch down to start a race, and it looks like it was wearing a royal blue sort of morph suit. Weird, I know, but that's what I thought that I saw. The figure ran out of the mirror and dissipated into the staircase on the other side of the hallway. After seeing that, I remember booking into my bedroom, closing the door and falling asleep with the lights on and the TV on that night. All that being said, I believe that whatever was in my house with us wasn't malicious. We took good care of the house and I like to think that the spirits appreciated us for that. I don't know if that's just me trying to make myself feel better or if that's actually what happened. So I absolutely want to make clear that this story is true. My wife and I both witnessed this and we'll never forget what we saw last night. I'm a 43-year-old man, a former marine with a lot of time at sea, and a former railroader. So, I have been to a lot of places that are just hard to get to for most folks, and I have never seen anything like what we saw last night. It happened on a Highway 50 in between Penrose and Pueblo, Colorado. My wife was working a closing shift in Cannon City last night. I left and made the drive west as usual. After she clocked out, we went to pick up our son from his job, only to find that he wasn't working last night. On the drive back from there, you pass Penrose, and then there's this place that I've always called the Big Hole. The Big Hole is actually called Pierce Gulch. There is a significant drop in elevation, and then you immediately climb back up, hence the nickname. But as we were approaching Big Hole at about 12.40 a.m., Something, traveling from north to south, crossed all four lanes and median of Highway 50 at an incredible rate of speed. We were the only vehicle out there at this time of night, and we nearly hit it. It was roughly three feet tall, I would say, and had long brown hair everywhere. And again, this thing was just booking it. Faster than any animal I had ever seen or even heard of. My wife was driving and had our son on speakerphone, she was startled and looked at me and asked, what the heck was that? By this time, we were down in the bottom of the gulch and headed back up the hill. We told our son what we saw and she got off the call. We discussed it for a second and decided to go back and see if maybe it had gotten caught in the barbed wire fence or something. Maybe there was some trace of this thing and we both were amazed by how fast it was moving though. By 12.45, we had traveled back to the west side of the gulch and turned around. There wasn't any traffic, so my wife just slowly rolled down the shoulder of the highway and I had my window down and was shining a flashlight that I had in the car out into the field. But there isn't much out there, obviously, except for cactus and stuff like that. But as we came up on the approximate area, we saw this thing. I told my wife, Hey, look, do you see those eyes? She said yes and stopped the car. Ten yards or so on the other side of the fence was a pair of very bright, very blue eyes, but not far off the ground. I was thinking that we probably were looking at a coyote or something. 
It was looking directly back at us, though. But what happened next? I will never forget as long as I live. Because whatever those eyes belonged to stood up like a man does. Like a six, seven foot man. They were still looking at us. Whatever it was that flew across the road at like Mach 2, this was definitely it. This was the hairy thing that we saw and there was a moment of sort of disbelief and shock I think. And then as it registered that we found the thing and it wasn't just some animal, the fear kicked in. I told my wife to go, just get out of here. It all seemed like slow motion though. She floored the gas and the thing watched us leave and we already knew that this thing was incredibly fast so she drove as fast as she could up and out of the gulch and I was looking out the back window and checking mirrors. My wife was afraid that it might be following us. But thankfully it wasn't and I didn't want to make things worse by admitting that I was worried too. We drove very fast for several minutes. We talked but it was like we were sort of each talking to ourselves like what was that and was it waiting for us? Soon the lights from the west were ahead and we were back into civilization. Once we got into the city we finally started to relax a bit. We talked until we got home and then checked the car for anything. We couldn't really go to sleep for hours after that. My wife got online and was searching for anything that matched the creature that we saw. She found some stories, paranormal in nature, of other people witnessing a creature that sounded exactly like the one that we had seen. But she has to work the same shift tonight, so on our way out to the city, we're going to stop and go out into the field where we saw this thing and see if there's any evidence. Footprints or hair or something. I'll update you guys if I find anything unusual. Wish me luck. So my dad owns some land in eastern Kentucky where I frequently ride and hike and hang out in the woods on my own. Currently the trails that we use are overgrown with many trees down so we can't actually take our ATVs up the mountain and neither can anyone else. Surrounding the property is 4,000 acres of logging property and an old train tunnel that nobody really goes near. Sometimes our neighbours will walk our trails but they only do it with their dogs or take up their ATVs and typically only go at night to hunt or whenever we aren't there, mainly because they know that we don't condone them being on our property. Today though, I decided to do some homework out near the creek which runs through the main holler, which is a normal occurrence for me really. At this time though, I decided to go back up much further into the woods than I typically do, just because I wanted to explore a bit more. Knowing the property pretty well, there was a trail above my head up the mountain about 100 feet that was overgrown that nobody could have gotten to on foot, not without a lot of work at least. I was hanging out as usual and I'd been out in the woods for maybe an hour and a half at this point. It was around 5. Being summertime though, the hollow was still lit up enough that I was comfortable out there. It had gotten quiet all of a sudden though and I suddenly heard a man yell, Hey! Almost like someone was trying to get my attention. The yell was very casual and conversational and it sounded almost like when my dad yells hey at me. As soon as I heard it, I knew that it was coming from the trail above my head and I also knew that I didn't hear anyone walk around, any tree limbs snapping, which there were a bunch on the ground up there, or even any leaves rustling. I immediately got out of my hammock and started back to my car and out of the woods. I didn't hear another hay or anything else. I got to my car and made it home and told my dad about what happened. He tried to explain it saying that it could have been a neighbor but we realized that that wasn't very likely even if it was a neighbor because I'd never met any of them and why would they try to get my attention if they didn't know me and knew they weren't supposed to be on the property in the first place. That's when he told me that he had also heard something unexplainable out in the hollow by himself too. You see, he said earlier one morning when he was clearing trails, he heard a shriek that put chills down his spine. Growing up in the woods, he knows the sounds that foxes, bobcats and all those animals make. And he's certain that it wasn't that. He'd never actually heard something like this before. He also mentioned that upon talking to the locals about the property... They called the holler that I was in 
the Devil's Den. But we haven't gotten the chance to ask why yet. If anybody knows what might be out there though, and how to defend myself, I'm all ears. Also, if you have any questions about anything, ask away and I'll do my best to answer. So, some set up stuff about myself before I get to the meat of this story. Specifically Yarmhill County, a moderately sized, mostly rural county. I'm half Native American and half Caucasian. Unfortunately, as I live in Oregon and my tribe lives elsewhere, and because of the pandemic going on right now, I haven't been able to visit my specific tribe as of yet. I'm over 18, though I don't want to disclose my own age for privacy reasons. I live with my mom, who is where I get my Caucasian from, and sister too, and my dad passed away about two and a half years ago. We also have three dogs of varying size and four outdoor cats. In the part of Oregon that I live in, you're never even 10 minutes away from a forest, the 20 from a mountaintop, and even in cities too. There's plenty of forestry just pretty much everywhere, but I live just outside of one of these towns, only a short several minute drive away, but far enough to where light pollution doesn't heavily affect me and I can still see the stars rather clearly. I've lived in this house since I was a kid and though I've always gotten the creeps about this place since it's next to a giant forest, it's been a while since anything that I could categorize as paranormal happened to me. I'm also generally a pretty skeptical person and not so superstitious if I'm being honest. I think science could explain around 95% of the world's mysteries, though I've seen some stuff that I still have no rational explanation for, I'll admit. And the things that have happened to me over the past three days definitely fall solidly into that category. Uh, I know a decent bit about skinwalkers. They come from the Ewart and Navajo tribe legends, being witches that are the antithesis to medicine men, commonly found around the Four Corners area of the US and around Navajo reservations, but uh, my knowledge is limited to different internet retellings of the legends, so I only know a few baseline rules. Don't fall for their imitation voices. If you smell dead, rotting meat, then you need to leave ASAP. Don't acknowledge its presence directly, don't say its name out loud unless you want to attract one, and if you want to harm one, you'll need white ashes, like that from burnt wood. You can also burn sage if you suspect one being near you or hunting you, and if you happen to spot its true human identity, then you can say its name and accuse it of being a skinwalker to apparently kill it. How much of that is true, I am still totally unsure of, obviously for a number of reasons too, but the largest being that I don't think any of the videos I watched were made by natives who would probably have more intimate knowledge of these creatures, but I could be talking out of my butt for sure on that one, and I don't know, it could be completely different for all I know. But also some background for this property too. According to the previous owners, who are a part of a family who have lived here for generations, there was once a log cabin built here on top of a native burial ground, which is also on a long inactive volcano. Sounds cliche, I know, but apparently it's absolutely true as far as I can tell. The burial ground part at least, and the inactive volcano part apparently is fully true as well, but I don't know. But what I do know is that there have been a, a number of odd, unexplainable phenomena here, which I'll try to keep short, but here it goes. So, the most notable one includes 12-foot metal doors belonging to a car paint booth being shook intensely by absolutely nothing. An old 50s metal gas oil can flying up from behind a ton of junk and flying directly at one of my dad's friends. A running sound followed up by the mirror door in my parents' bedroom being shattered at 3am one night. And at the exact same time, my dad's best man apparently died. And needless to say that while I haven't encountered any Bigfoot or Mothman or anything like that, I've seen some stranger things that have no logical explanation. So the property I live on is around 10 acres in size. The house is decently large with a, a one-car garage and office, which is where my sister is currently chilling out at, next to it, and a large metal garage around 200 yards east from the house. 
The smaller garage and the house have motion lights all around their perimeters for proper illumination in case anything or anyone gets near the house, but the larger garage only has like a halogen bulb outside of its main door that went out last week in fact, and now at night that entire area of the property is just pitch black. The house has three doors too, two on a porch, two to the front yard and driveway, one to the laundry room and into the backyard. The one on the eastmost side is the living room one with nine windows and one of the doors, a kitchen area with a view onto the porch, another living room type area and then halfway to the bathrooms and the bedrooms too. The office in the smaller garage has two entrances, one heading directly into the backyard that's sliding glass and two partially iron, partially glass doors that head into the garage itself. The metal garage was actually built over the aforementioned cabin and has an attic that spans over the entire length of it. It has a car lift, a paint booth that can fit a limousine, a bathroom and also scaffolding with a heater in it, which is where apparently the gas can flew from. Around 15 feet behind the shop is a large forest that I've never stepped foot into due to there being a crazy old man living in it. But while I haven't stepped into it too, my sister and her friends have headed in a few times, each time returning with odd objects too. And although they haven't gone into the forest for like several years now, I do remember them bringing out stuff like Baphomet statues, animal bones and weird sort of rocks before. Aside from these, though, the only things we see out here animal-wise are does and baby deer just passing on through our yard to get into the forest. But now for the current events. So, around 4am on Saturday night, I was preparing to go to bed out in my family living room. My room is painted black and being the summer here, it gets ridiculously hot at day and I don't have good AC at the moment, so I'm sleeping out in the living room. But as I was about to go to sleep, I heard the cats fighting. Something not that odd, they're mostly males and get pretty riled up from time to time, but then I heard something else. There were three distinct knocks on one of my front doors. This immediately freaked me out for a few reasons. For one, it's like 4am and pitch black outside. And these knocks were far too loud for an animal to make and sounded just far too high for the either. And second, my motion tracker lights were still off. After the knocking, my dog's headed towards the other front door. This one is the partially iron one, partially glass, like those on the office, and they just completely lost their minds with barking. Something they only ever do when they see something that they don't recognize. At this, I locked all my windows, closed all the blinds, and... I just sat on my couch bed. In my living room, facing out towards the front yard, there's a half circle shaped window with no blinds that allows me to see when the motion tracker turns on or off and I just sat there staring at this window for about an hour and a half until they finally came on and then the sun came up. I didn't really have the courage to go and look as to what caused the lights to trigger but anyway... The next morning, I asked my mum if she heard a knocking on the door to get a disturbing answer from her and my sister, because my mum had also heard the knocking, but also heard it on her windows to the bedroom, and my sister heard it knocking on the sliding glass door to the office too. I knew then that this was something that had knocked multiple times, as there was just no way that I could have mistaken the tapping on my door for something tapping on my sister's door. While the sun was up, my sister and I bought some sage, since from what I know, it wards off skinwalkers and other things. But my mum accidentally misplaced it before we could burn it. And by the time that we realized that we couldn't find it, the shop that we went to had closed, so we had to just hope nothing worse would happen that night. But the second night was so much more disturbing than the first. And while I didn't spot anything, I definitely heard a a loud, ambient noise coming from the woods. The nearest broad comparison that I could make is like how a, a city sounds at night when there's construction, but this sounded more natural in origin, in some really odd way. Another much more niche comparison would be the song Cave of the Past from Earthbound, as it's the only song that I can think of that fits the ambience. 
but I heard this thing for what must have been around half an hour while I walked my dogs in my front yard and while I wanted to just stay inside and drown out my paranoia with some anime, my mum had me take out the dogs claiming that there's nothing out there that could harm you and this in spite of the fact that she heard the knocking the night before. As I was walking the last dog though, I heard something from the forest to the east and it sounded like maybe chanting? I only heard about one short sentence in some dialect that I couldn't discern, but that was all I needed to hear in order to head inside and lock everything up again. From there, I could hear the ambience, though, even inside my house, and was up again until the sun crested over the hills. One more thing, too, about this night, though, was that there was a light that refused to go out. It was one of the motion trackers on the one car garage, and each time I would look out at it, I wouldn't see anything, but... Yet it just stayed on all throughout the night. Anyway, finally tonight, I woke up late as staying up until sunrise tends to do that to me, so I forgot to get the sage before I headed to work. Once I came home from work, it was already dark out as I get off by the time the sun is setting. Around 2am, I was taking out my dogs for the last time, and tonight there wasn't any ambience or chanting and... I stayed strictly to the small plot of yard directly in front of my house, but as I was once again taking out the last dog, I heard a noise to the east, and this absolutely scared me half to death. It sounded like something absolutely enormous had been knocked over or thrown down, something that was loud enough for me to hear hundreds of yards away. Immediately too, I turned towards the noise and tugged on my dog's leash to drag them inside, keeping my back to the illuminated sections of my yard while I went in there. I've locked all my doors, my car, and all the other things that I can, and I've tried ignoring everything, but I just feel like I, I need some help now. These events are slowly escalating, and I only fear that tomorrow that... It could bring on a, a full-on encounter with whatever this is. The fact that it's happened three nights in a row really hasn't helped with my sleeping patterns, but thankfully I finally got some sleep last night. And while I think that it could be a skinwalker maybe, I, I also think that it could be a wendigo. They're similar in nature, but if it was the latter though, I have a hunch that it would have made itself more known already. Whereas with a skinwalker... I think it could be trying to lure me out to the darkness of the shop. I've been trying to get a hold of a medicine man here in Oregon, but all I can find on Google is old articles, almost as if it refuses to let me find the help that I need so desperately. If anyone knows where I could find one to come and bless the house and the property, I would be elated to get this over with. But these past few nights alone have been just terrible, and... I would rather not have to see what I've heard described many a times for myself. Anyway, thanks for listening if you've made it this far, and any advice is very much welcomed at this point. I swear to you too that everything that I'm telling you guys is true, although I will happily admit that everything that I've speculated about may not be. I just really want some peace and quiet out here again, and if you can help with that... I would really appreciate it. I live in a high crime country, so my home has an alarm linked to private security and the property is surrounded by a high wall too. There's also a roll down steel garage door in the wall which gives access directly onto the street. So I had just had a baby a few days ago and was sitting in the lounge watching TV while the baby slept next to me. I hear the exterior garage door sort of making opening noises but think that it's probably just my husband stopping by to check on us since the baby is so new and he was working close by that day anyway. But then I realized that my dogs are barking and it hasn't changed pitch. If it was my husband coming home then their barks would have changed to exciting yippee. So I sort of hobble into my bedroom which has a view of the exterior door and see a strange man has popped the side of the door open with a crowbar and is slithering through the gap into the property. No problem though, this is why we have security. So I sort of hobble run, 
remember I just had a baby, to the lounge and hit the panic button, which is supposed to set off the house alarm and send an SOS to the security company. But the panic button does nothing. It's completely dead. I ran back to the bedroom, my mind is just blank from the panic, and by now the man is starting to climb through the window. It dawns on me that nobody is coming to help me. My new baby is just in the other room. There's no time to phone anyone, so I hulk the heck out, bunch up my shoulders, start screaming like a banshee, and run directly at this guy. I'm 5'2 with a deflated pregnant belly, so I couldn't have looked that scary, but for whatever reason, he must have been pretty scared because he just let go of the window frame and literally fell onto the ground before scrambling up and back out of the popped open outside door. I was shaking and crying because... If he had kept coming, I, I really don't know what I would have done. My husband was home within minutes and we fixed that panic button the same day, but it was a close call, that's for sure. I've always been good friends with one of my cousins, Cole, who is the same age I am. The two of us were not quite inseparable, but we always did get along very well together and were often found together, both in school, as we'd always wound up in the same class together throughout elementary school, and outside of it too. We were 12 and in the 6th grade, I was hanging out with Cole on a Friday afternoon around the later part of May, and we were psyched because it was the start of the weekend. We wound up at his house since he didn't live too far from me and at one point my mum called to say that our grandpa was in the hospital. But while the issue with our grandpa wasn't expected to be life-threatening, he was being kept at the hospital overnight for observation and both my parents and Coles were planning on staying with him and grandma at the hospital since my mum and her sister were the two of their siblings who lived close by. I was told that I was given the okay to stay at Cole's house for the night, with Cole's 15-year-old brother Hunter being in charge while our parents were out. This was fine by us because I got along well enough with Hunter and he was never the bossy older brother, sort of cousin type, that some of my other friends said that they had to put up with. So we ordered out for pizza and enjoyed goofing off as boys that age tend to do. And at around 9 or so, there was a knock at the front door and Cole went to answer it. I was a bit curious as to who it could be at the time of night, and so I watched from a ways back. At the door were two older guys, and they said that they were with the city and that they were investigating reports about the water pressure supposedly being bad in the neighborhood. They asked Cole if his parents were home, and when Cole said that they were unavailable at that moment, which we were told to say to strangers if our parents weren't home, the guy started asking a bunch of questions about how the water pressure was in the house and if they could come inside to check. Hunter came over at that point and politely told the guys that the water pressure was fine and perhaps they should move on to check on other homes in the neighborhood. But the guys seemed reluctant to leave but eventually turned and walked away after Hunter started closing the door. After the door was shut, we just sort of looked at each other and shrugged, but didn't think too much of it after that and just went back to goofing off. Eventually, we decided to go to bed. Cole and Hunter shared a bedroom, and we all agreed that I'd sleep in there with them, rather than me hitting the sack on the couch or something like that, so that we could talk while we all just fell asleep, and Hunter grabbed a sleeping bag out of their camping supplies for me. And when we got into their bedroom, they stripped down to their briefs and... I remember Cole had mentioned to me once in a while back that they had started sleeping in just their underwear. Since I hadn't originally planned on staying the night too, I hadn't brought anything with me from home as far as overnight stuff was concerned anyway. But since I wasn't in the mood to sleep in my clothes, I stripped down to my briefs as well. Though I felt a bit embarrassed, I'll admit, even though we were all guys there and I knew they wouldn't say anything or be judgmental. But they climbed into their beds and I quickly crawled into the sleeping bag and after talking for a while about random stuff we eventually fell asleep. Early the next morning I got up because I had to pee and so I quietly got out of the sleeping bag and went and did my business in the bathroom. On the way back to the bedroom I heard something in the family room which was on the opposite end of the house from the bedrooms and particular bathroom that I was using. I didn't pay too much attention to it at the time thinking that it must be either Cole or Hunter. 
until I got back into the bedroom and realized that both of them were still in there. Trying not to panic now, I woke them up quickly and I told them that I thought somebody was in the house. They quietly followed me and the moment that we walked into the family room, we saw the two guys from the night before in there and it was rather clear that they were robbing the place. One of them started to move towards us as he pulled out a wicked looking knife. The three of us promptly raced to the front door, somehow managed to get it unlocked and open, and we fled outside immediately. As luck would have it too, a cop was driving by at that very moment. We quickly flagged him down and told him about the two guys in the house. The cop called for backup and within a couple of minutes several other cops were there and they proceeded to enter the house and after some searching they caught the two guys. The cops figured out that the two guys must have entered from a window in the laundry room that had a broken latch and it probably targeted that house because while it wasn't empty they probably realized that there were no adults there and figured that if we discovered them that we could have been more easily dealt with than adults could have. To add insult to injury though while we were waiting outside while the cops searched the house both to get the two guys and to make sure that there was no one else with them some of the neighbors came out to see what all the commotion was about and this included some kids who went to the same school as Cole and me including a few who were in our sixth grade class with us. It was during that time that the three of us realized that we never actually had a chance to get dressed so just like in the stereotypical nightmare we had to stand outside in full view of everyone in just our briefs for what seemed like forever before being allowed back inside. When we went back to school on Monday, Cole and I had to put up with more than a bit of snickering stares and ribbing for the next few weeks until school ended for the summer. I grew up in a, a cookie cutter suburban housing neighborhood in Southern California. One of those ones in like the early 2000s that literally every single house was the same plan and looked exactly the same on the outside. I moved there from the city of Los Angeles in the middle of school and man, I hated it. By the time that I was in 10th grade, I had left school and was in a homeschool program that gave me a lot of free time. The town felt cultish to me due to its extreme religious citizens, Mormon and Christianity, because I had never been exposed to intense religion before. Note too that I have nothing against these religions, it was just so far removed from my background that I was out of my element. But, but the event that I'm describing, it takes place in 2013. So my house was located on the last lot of the development and beyond us was beautiful 100 old oak trees, hiking trails and a lot of natural wildlife. And I spent a lot of time climbing trees and just playing in there too. I had a favorite tree in fact that I would walk past to get to the center of town often and one day I decided to build a tree house and a tire swing on it. It was right off a trail that was very popular to get to the schools and other places too, so I thought that it would be used a lot and was happy to share it with anyone passing by. I built the tree house in about maybe two weeks and then started on the tire swing. But when I was setting up the tire swing, I stepped on this patch of land that was just extremely spongy. This meant in my mind that it was probably hollow, right? And something was probably buried underneath it. So I dug it up and I dug some more and I found this Ziploc plastic sandwich bag with like yellow white crust inside. I didn't open it, I thought that it was trash that had food inside of it at one time so I just put it in my bag and I threw it away at my house. The next day I returned to finish my project, again I stepped on more hello ground though and I decided to dig some more and man I found some really weird stuff. I dug for a while and I found another Ziploc plastic sandwich bag with the same stuff as before. But this bag, it looked too new to be buried so far into the earth like that, so I knew that it had to have been buried recently. I tossed it aside though and I kept digging. And then I found a plastic sealed pack of pages with writing on them. 
Water had leaked into the bag, so the ink was smeared, but it just looked like pages from a small child's diary with scribbles and pictures. It was odd, I admit, but I kept digging and then I found another bag with 1980s pornography that had been printed out from an old website. The watermark said 2000, but there was like water damage on that too. I then found a bag with old family photos that looked to be around the same era of 2000 or 2002 or something. The photos were of a, a white family and all normal photos of people at a dinner table, a, a birthday party, a sea ward. Same children, two girls and a boy, same mum and dad too. I kept digging and I found another bag of that crusty white yellow stuff in a bag. Under that bag was some children homework sheets and under that was another white yellow crusty bag. Now, I had no idea what to do with all of this, obviously. I didn't want these things, but there were only a few photos of the pornography and they all had some sort of water damage because it was on computer paper. But the only thing that was untouched were the family photos because it was in film prints. So in the end, I just decided that I should rebury them. I really didn't know what to do. But a few weeks pass and I visit my new fort and have some fun and I see other people have come and went but nothing is disturbed. But one day too I visit and my whole fort is ruined and destroyed. I was pretty saddened by that but I just chalked it up to other teenagers my age messing with me or kids just doing really stupid stuff. But my swing was still up though so I walked over to go and sit on it and my foot sunk into the ground again. I brushed some leaves away and I saw a plastic bag. I picked it up and inside of it the same exact Ziploc plastic bags as the other times. But this time inside of it was semen. Clear as day and a lot of it. I was so disgusted as soon as I figured it out that I flung it away from me. It wasn't warm or anything, but still in slight liquid form, which was gross. I dug a bit though with my hands and found more family photos than before, from the same era, same family. But this time, I just felt extremely weirded out and had this gut feeling of just, I don't know, badness. Nothing really made sense, but in the end, I just put the stuff back and walked in a different direction of my fort and saw a guy in his 40s by himself walking towards my fort behind me. I instantly felt afraid too because we were hidden from the houses. The majority of the people I saw on the trail were kids my age or younger too because all there was to do in this place was climb trees and build kids forts in the woods. But he ducked into my fort and I walked further in the opposite direction. I waited for a while but it was getting dark and the only path back to my house was to pass through my fort and I was afraid that he was still there. I did it anyway and sure enough, he was still there. And this time, he had his willy out. And you can probably guess what he was doing. He made eye contact with me and carried on and I just ran as fast as I could to my house. I called the police and reported that a man had exposed himself but... Other than that, nothing ever really happened. I uh, haven't gone back since. Uh, a few years later, I think the area burned down anyway, but they could never pin it on anyone, so they said that it must have just been teenagers smoking cigarettes. I uh, apologize in advance for the incredibly long story, but we've lived in this house for almost eight years now and there's just a lot to share. So our neighborhood sits on the original town cemetery from the 1800s. In the 70s when they built the neighborhood they only removed the graves that they needed to, but they put in foundations and the sewer system and whatnot. We actually didn't know that too until we'd been living here for like three or four years, but when I found out... It explained a lot of things. While we were still in the process of moving in too, we hadn't even spent the first night in the house, I heard two little kids talking. I heard it clear as day in fact. A girl, probably around 10 or 12, and a little boy who sounded no older than 5 I would guess. 
I only have two brothers, both younger than me, but I'm still older than either of those kids sounded. To be honest too, it sounded like any younger siblings playing, and because it sounded so normal, I can't even remember what was said. Obviously too, the first thing that I did was call out to them, and the playing stopped. And after that, I never heard them leave. I searched the house, but nobody was inside. Everyone was in the backyard putting together our swing set. I told my mum what I'd heard, and of course she didn't believe me, so I just dropped it and we moved on. Months later, though, I'm in my room trying to sleep when I roll over and see the reflection of a girl in my TV screen. I realized that I was seeing her back, long curly blonde hair and in the 1800s blue dress sort of thing, but... Somehow in my sleep deprived brain I thought that it was my own life size doll and ignored it and I just went back to sleep. And when I woke up I realized that it definitely was not that, the wrong color and the doll was facing the TV anyway so I would have seen the face reflected, not the back of her head that was against the wall. I don't tell my mum though because, well, that didn't work last time very well. But after that, stuff starts moving around. Things fall off the stairs that are carpet and the lights around the house turn off and on at random too. I can hear people walking around all the time but still my mother doesn't believe me which is really stupid because she actually believes in ghosts. In the end though I affectionately name the ghost girl Lizzie because it just feels right. I don't know. I'm not that afraid of her or anything so I named her. But finally one day I'm out with my friends doing teenager stuff at like 11pm and my mum calls me. She says, tell Lizzie not to scare me. Turns out that she'd gotten up to use the bathroom and when she went back to bed, she'd seen a black orb hovering over her side of the bed. But when she saw it, it quickly exited via the ceiling and then she called me. And it wasn't long after that that we found the local news articles about our neighbourhood and also the cemetery. But we also found out that uh, during a flood one year, one particular casket kept popping back up and it had to be moved. And that a lot of the neighborhood have headstones still visible in their yards. But we're horrified too because we definitely noticed some weirdly flat stones out near our garden and one only five or six feet from the fruit trees that we planted too. So now we all just accept that we live with a, a ghost or two. Weird stuff happens all the time. They stopped throwing stuff off the stairs, but now, weirdly, they show up in our Xbox Connect, turn sinks on, occasionally knock stuff over, and sometimes I even hear them talking faintly. I haven't seen either of them since the first time, but I know that they're still around. But we sort of treat them like family, I suppose. We talk to them, offer snacks, leave toys out to play with. Yeah, life is weird and new people in the house never take long to notice how weird we are, but also lately I've been seeing a shadow cat hanging around too. We have two cats already, but neither of them can disappear through walls, so there's that. But anyway, on one occasion my friends and I were leaving the house one day, I don't remember where we were going, and mum comes around the corner swearing that she saw someone walking down the hallway. We were all in the living room and my brothers weren't home and at the time we had our Xbox set up on a dresser with its own TV so the kids could play games without taking over the living room and whatnot and said dresser was right next to the doorway that leads into the hall. Mum says that she thinks she heard the Xbox turn on and comments on how easy it would probably be for the ghost to turn it on since the button is so sensitive. But we all have a good chuckle at the idea of a ghost girl playing video games and we just continue at the door. Not even 10 minutes later, my mum calls me to tell me that the Xbox has in fact been turned on and off repeatedly. She's trying to watch TV and it's starting to freak her out though, but I laugh because of course Lizzie would do that. I hear mum politely ask her to stop because it's distracting and the beeping from the console stops for maybe a minute or two before it starts up again. Mum makes me come back early Supposedly because Lizzie likes me and she'll stop if I ask. The Xbox continues to turn on and off at random, albeit every once in a while now for the next week. Now when our consoles or even the TV turns on by itself, we'll always ask her what she wants to watch or play. 
But we never really get any sort of definitive answer though, but I don't know. The whole situation is weird. My family is weird. I, I know that. But I thought that I would just share this because I wanted to get it off my chest. And if you've made it this far, then thanks for listening. I have a lot of other stories too about our otherworldly guests, I suppose you could call them. But uh, this is long enough already and yeah, I'll leave it at that. So this is a short one, but it's something that's never left me. It happened when I was 12 or 13 years old. We were visiting our ex-neighbors and took our two little dogs with us. At some point after lunch, our parents asked my friend and I to take the dog out for a walk. While on our way back to the apartment, we saw a creepy dude sort of walking in our direction. His behavior was really weird too, sort of whistling very suspiciously, looking at the sky with a terrifying grin on his face. I knew that it was bad the second my dogs were growling and barking at him too, way before he even got near us. I mean, they just never do this. They're just so nice and sweet and I even suspect that they would even greet a, a thief breaking into our home nicely. Yeah. But anyway, we naturally ran away and we got back home quickly. We later found out though that, turns out, this guy was known in the neighborhood for being a pedophile and had several other mental health issues. And chances are that we got out of there in the nick of time. When I was younger, every year for Christmas, I would drive upstate to my aunt's house along a stretch of highway, and I just cannot for the life of me remember the name of the road. All I know is that uh, it runs nearby Akron and Y at some point. However, most of the drive is through rural areas with little to no towns nearby. But anyway... It was the dead of night and my groggy self had gotten off a, a long shift and had to drag my butt to my aunt's house since my extended family was expecting me the following morning. Near halfway through the drive, I realized that I was low on gas, which irritated me. My brother told me that he had filled it up the day before, so he either forgot or was straight up lying, but I saw some sort of an archaic looking sign for a gas station off the next road. It wasn't an official road sign or anything, literally a pole with a slab of metal attached with gas off next exit, or something along those lines painted on anyway. And although it seemed a little sketchy, uh, people do the same thing with fruit stands on highways, so whatever. I pulled off the next exit on some dilapidated country road through dense woods, and to be honest, the whole thing was sort of creepy and surreal. I kept expecting Leatherface to come running out of the trees with a chainsaw at any moment. But eventually I came to the gas station thankfully and realized quickly that it hadn't been open for years. It was all rusted and the convenience store's roof was caving in. The gas pumps had all been taken out as well. I pulled over next to it and I checked my gauge. I would probably only make it another half mile before running out so... I called AAA and they said that they'd send a truck over as quickly as they could. And now I played the waiting game. I left my engine on because when the headlights were off everything was absolutely pitch black and my paranoid self wasn't sitting next to an abandoned gas station in the middle of a forest in complete darkness. So most of the wait went pretty uneventful I suppose. Until I sensed movement around the side of the old store where my lights are pointed. I look up, but I didn't see anything more, so I just sort of look back down at my phone. Then, over the sounds of the night, I hear someone yell, Hey buddy, come over here, in a sort of demanding tone. I look up, and I kid you not, there's a dude standing by the old store, just looking towards me, illuminated by my headlights. He looked like a run-of-the-mill sort of homeless guy, I suppose. I was honestly pretty spooked out and figured that he must have been squatting there or something. I'm still watching him. I rolled down my window and I yelled something like, Yeah, what's up? Still mentally terrified. I had my foot ready to floor it out of there at the first sign of trouble, in fact. But he said, You got any change? And I said, Nah, I don't. Sorry, man. 
I look up at him and he has this kind of vacant expression and he's just standing sort of completely stiff. And then I see more movement. There are heads, about 20 or so heads in fact, peeking around the trees beyond the man that I'm talking to. I can't see them clearly at all, but they're definitely people, literally just heads staring in my direction from around the trees. I see another guy beginning to walk from around the gas station, and that was enough for me. I turned around as quickly as I could, and I just sped off. I got as far away from that place as my tank would carry me, and I updated AAA on my location. The driver came back over and filled me up, and I didn't say anything, but... After he left, I wanted to call the cops, so I called the nearest town sheriff department and they said that they would send a trooper over and I gave them the location. When I got to my aunt's house, they called me back and said that whoever was there was now gone, but they could tell that a large number of people had actually been living there for quite a while. Blankets, canned food, the usual stuff like that. The whole situation still freaks me out to this day, but frankly, I suppose I could consider myself lucky that I'll always have such a creepy story to tell. But I'm just glad that nothing bad happened. So, to put it as simply as I can, I was in a very terrifying relationship when I was pretty young. I had actually gotten married when I was 17 to my boyfriend of three years, and I'm just going to call him Dave, but Dave was a complete psycho. He was obsessed with blood, occult things, and Charles Manson even. He always talked about how if I left him to watch out for missing redheads on the news because he was going to find me and Ted Bundy me. And when I did finally leave him, it was really scary. He tried to end his own life, he totally tore his own arm open and wrote my name in his blood on my sheets and on my wall. I still had to stay there for a few days to pack my things though and I was terrified that he was going to kill me or himself. He kept saying things like, if I can't have you then no one can and in another world together we can try again. What the heck right? And... I would also wake up to him standing over my bed while I was sleeping. But one night, a night that I'll never forget, I woke up to the sound of him saying, if I can't have her then no one can. I froze and I was scared because something was different about this time. I peeked my eyes open but not enough to where he would know that I was awake. And he was standing over me with a huge knife from our kitchen and was tracing the tip of the knife up and down on his arm and whispering things to himself. I instantly turned toward him and opened my eyes and we made eye contact. He stopped whispering. He started to walk toward me and I just said, please don't. He stopped. He stared at me for a while and then walked to the stairs or the door of my room. He turned around at the door and stared at me for a while again with the knife in his hands and I didn't know if I was going to die or if it was him or not but after a few minutes he just walked down the stairs and he went to sleep. For some backstory I've always been interested in paranormal activity. It terrifies me but fascinates me all at the same time and I've always felt sensitive to it, I suppose. I'm the first one to sort of notice cold spots or energy that just feels different or off in the house, and I've had many personal encounters with activity. But when I was a kid, my parents finally found a deal that worked for them on a good-sized home after months and months of searching. We were not wealthy by any stretch of the word, and my mum was about seven months pregnant with my little sister, so she wasn't working a lot. But we also had my two stepsisters from my dad's previous marriage that would come and stay with us occasionally and it was always a struggle in the smaller duplexes and trailers that we lived in prior. So when my parents were able to afford a three-story house, they were elated. Obviously too, I'm getting this part of the portion of the story from them, but they said that when they went to look at the house, they 
just immediately felt uneasy. It was a wide open living dining area, but they felt very claustrophobic and sort of short of breath. But they felt that they were being watched and had extreme waves of paranoia and anxiety, but they chalked it up to being emotionally overwhelmed due to the recent financial struggles. And in the end, they were just so excited to have the place that they completely ignored their gut instinct and they closed the deal. And so, in we went. On move-in day, we walk through the front door and the very first thing that we see is one window in the living room just completely covered in flies. None flying through the room, none on any other windows, and there were so many that only a couple of rays of light were peering through. My dad thought that there must be a dead animal outside, so we went out to look, but there was no carcass or anything. In fact, he had to come and sort of scrape them off the window himself. But we get moved in, and the first few nights were relatively calm, if I'm being honest. I remember hearing a few creaks and moans, but the house was old, so my parents reassured me that it was just the wood. But then, my cat started acting really weird. For instance, one night she was on my mum's lap just relaxing and out of nowhere she just bolts up to all fours, back lurched up to the ceiling and starts hissing at absolutely nothing. But there was nobody in the room and my dog was downstairs but she was just staring at the top of our staircase like she was about to attack something but there was nothing there. My mum was pretty freaked out but... She brushed it off and she went back to watching TV and my cat went to the stairs. The stairs were sort of tiered so there were four at the bottom and they leveled out to a little platform and then there were about 20 that led to our bedrooms upstairs. My cat walked to the top and immediately just froze. Almost like she was taxidermied and all of a sudden she just flies off the stairs. She didn't jump mind you and she definitely didn't fall. There was just no way with the trajectory and how she was there and whatnot that she could have flown this way, but it was honestly like she was thrown from there. In fact, it sort of looked like something kicked her off the top as hard as it could. She didn't touch the ground until about 15 stairs down and then just scampered off into the kitchen and didn't leave for the rest of the night. And my mum lost her mind at that and called my dad who came in and consoled her and they went to bed. Fast forward to winter though and we have our dog in our basement. She was an outside dog by choice and we would let her out to the potty and bring her in and not 30 seconds later she would just wind to go back out. She roamed our backyard which was plenty spacious. She was the sweetest dog I ever met. No bias too. Never so much as growled at anyone. Every person that she met pretty much was just her best friend. She was also very energetic though and the basement housed all of my dad's work tools at one end so we had her on a chain that was just long enough to let her get to every part of the basement but that little corner because we didn't want her messing up my dad's stuff. But one night my dad went down to check on her and spend some time with her. We had a door that opened to a small staircase down in the basement and as soon as my dad saw her he knew that something just wasn't right. She was at the end of her chain pulling so hard that she was almost choking herself. Every hair on her back was on end and she was growling as loud as she could and my dad said that he'd never seen a dog that angry before. And this is a dog that he's known since she was born so she knows him and she didn't think that he was a stranger. But she was snarling and drooling and my dad said that she wasn't looking at him but behind him like he was invisible. My dad is a tough-as-nails Missouri redneck too, never been scared of pretty much anything a day in his life, but that day I, I saw genuine fear in his eyes. He came back up, pale as a cloud with the dog, and said that something in this house did not want us here. Over the next few months, we had a sort of smattering of activity. We heard whistling at night, someone would knock on the door, but there would be nobody there. Out of nowhere, we would smell the overwhelming scent of fresh roses. One night, we were playing hide-and-seek, and my sister hid in the closet, just big enough for her to fit in with those weird sort of accordion doors, so no lock or anything, and I walked by and heard her giggling, so I told her that I found you, and went to open the door, but I couldn't. 
She thought that I was joking at first, and I was young, I'll admit, but not young enough to not be able to open an accordion door. She started yelling for me to let her out, but for the life of me, I just could not get this door open. I yelled for my dad, and he came to try, and lo and behold, he couldn't open it either. And It was honestly like someone was holding it shut. Again, though, my dad is tough as nails, and a complete hillbilly redneck, and he's a strong guy. And he was yanking on this door with all of his strength, but he just couldn't get it open for the life of him. It got to the point, in fact, where we had to tear apart the door with a hammer to use the knob on the inside. Eventually, we were all so terrified of this place that we called my grandpa to come and bless the house. He was a very um, spiritual man and had experience with the paranormal and went so far as to get himself ordained. He came with holy water and sage and he did his thing, but the second that he started, it was like he was just soaking wet with sweat. Like he had just run a marathon to get there. He told us right off the bat that something was definitely there. It was not nice and it didn't want us there. He took about two hours and went through the whole house and when he got to the basement, he hesitated, but he went in anyway saying that that was the hot spot. We were upstairs while well, he was down there, but he swore till the day that he died that he saw the shadow of an old man in the corner just staring at him. He was a jokester, but never when it came to his family or their well-being, and he also took this sort of thing very, very seriously. Like I said, he was very spiritual, and this was definitely not his first rodeo. When he finished, though, he said that we should be safe for now, but to look at moving as soon as humanly possible, so that is exactly what we did. We moved, not even a month later, and we never thought twice about ever going back. These were my first major experiences with the paranormal, and I've experienced plenty of it since then, but that house will forever stick with me as one of the scariest places that I've ever been to. There was just something really dark there, and I sincerely hope that whoever moved in after us was able to live there safely. If anyone has any questions, or wants to talk about other experiences that I've had, then please do ask away because I might be able to share them in another story here. And of course, I'm more than happy to share them too. Anyway, thanks for listening if you got this far and I hope you guys have a, a great week. I'm a 31-year-old woman and this happened a few years back. I was walking from a friend's house to meet my son's father, X, at a bar that we frequented in those days. It was winter, icy and snowing with giant piles of snow all around. I was walking from a friend's house around 9pm down an alley that served as a driveway area for many houses. Not a great neighbourhood by any means, but not particularly bad either. I was wearing my apocalypse boots, waterproof, knee-high, winterproof, and I usually have headphones in blaring music while I walk, but... That night, for some reason, I can't remember, I just decided not to. And in hindsight, that may have been the very thing that saved me. So I'm about the equivalent of two to three blocks away from the bar. There's a younger guy, early 20s, walking about 50 feet behind me. And he says, hey you. I turn around. It seems that he's talking to somebody else. Hey. I look back, then continue walking. Yeah, you. No, don't turn around, sweetheart. I start to walk faster as I realize that he's getting closer. Ahead of me, I see an SUV running, backed out of a parking spot, but blocking my path, and I turn around, and there's another guy. The door to the SUV opens, and there's a couple of guys in it looking at me. One gets out and stands by the open door. I turn to look at the guy behind me, when out of nowhere, about five more guys come out, surrounding me from a distance, slowly closing in. The realization that they were hiding behind piles of plowed snow hits me, and I realize that they were just standing and watching me. A couple of them had their phones out and were recording something that was about to go down. Nobody was smiling, but they were closing in on me, trying to get me to walk to the SUV. The final flight kicked in, though, and I just decided that I didn't want to know what was about to happen to me, 
I wanted to catch them off guard, so instead of running forward, I bolted to the left. And thank God for those boots, I could run across the ice no problem. I ended up cutting through a few yards and made it to the bar, and eventually I got away. But if it weren't for the fact that that ice was so slippery and I had those boots on, I think that I would have been done for. I would like to start this off by saying that this actually took place a few years ago, but it seemed relevant to share here because, well, a lot of people are doing online dating right now. So one summer when I was in law school, I was swiping through Tinder just looking for someone to hang out with. I matched with this guy who seemed pretty nice and looked good. Lots of shirtless photos if you catch my drift, and he was a counselor at a local high school in the metro area. We texted for a while, talked on the phone, and then decided to grab brunch the next weekend. I met him at the restaurant and we had brunch. He was nice, funny, made me laugh a lot. I think we both got a, a little bit tipsy and he said that he was going back to a barbecue at his friend's house after brunch and asked me to come with him. He seemed pretty cool and I was having a good time, so I agreed. I had to walk my dog because I hadn't anticipated being out that long, so... I told him that I would meet him back at the restaurant in 30 minutes. He said that he really wanted to meet my dog and asked if he could come walk the dog with me and I sort of thought about it for a second but my place was just a total disaster so I told him no in the end. But eventually I came back to the restaurant and we grabbed an Uber to his friend's house. There were a bunch of people drinking and talking and everyone was nice. They had the barbecue situation going on out back and we talked to some people and hung out, drank. He started to get drunk and also handsy, so I told him that I wanted to drink and walked into the kitchen for some space. A couple of minutes later, he comes into the kitchen and tries to kiss me. I kind of smiled at this and shrugged my way out of his grasp, and I told him that I needed to go to the bathroom. I asked him to grab me a drink and meet me outside in the backyard, and when I left the restroom, I just walked straight out the front door, two blocks down, and I took a ride. I grabbed an Uber home and I started getting calls and texts, but I blocked him. He tried to reach out over social media, but I also blocked him there too, and I pretty much totally forgot about him. But fast forward three years, I'm sitting on the couch just sort of chilling, reading through the local news on my phone, and I scroll and see a picture of this guy's face again. And he had been arrested for raping women that he met on Tinder all these years. My family and I had just come home from staying in a small house near the Redwoods in CA and immediately after arriving home everyone decides to sleep since it's very late. After everyone is asleep I hear a noise in the basement though so I head down there cracking the door open how I always do. That's when I hear the noise again behind me Sounding like someone gasping for air. Turning around quickly, I see a woman with long black hair, pale white skin, and a white gown soaking wet as if she had just gone for a swim completely clothed. She opens her mouth, making one more loud gasp for air. Then I woke up, realizing that it was just a dream. The next day, my father tells me how after I went to sleep last night, the security system started acting up. It was not letting him engage because it claimed that the basement door was cracked open. Even after he made sure that it was closed, it was still going off though. My mother later that day told me around 3.30 that she woke up and decided to get some water. And going out into the kitchen, she sees the basement door propped open. Being the only person that does this, she asked if it was me. And I tend to sleepwalk sometimes, but my smartwatch says that I never left my bed that night. Anyway, three months after this, I was looking up the history of that house and I came across a, a triple homicide plus suicide case. This took place nine months before we visited and it stated a father took his wife out to the house's private pond, then wrapped his hands around her neck, forcing her down in the water. After he lured out his two young daughters, he drowned them too and he finished it off and blew his own brains out. Apparently, the neighbor's CCTV footage caught it all, and to this day, uh, I can still hear a 
very loud scratching and opening of the basement door while I'm awake in my bed. It's genuinely terrifying and thankfully nothing else has happened so far, but I don't know. What do you guys think? So I live in a state just full of horrible serial killer stories. My hairdresser's sister was nearly a Bundy victim. My mum's friend was followed every night on her bike by a strange man as a child. There was a serial rapist that molested many of my grandma's classmates in first grade. And you get the point. Just uh, a lot of horrifying stuff. However, recently I found out just how close my family was to one of these cases. So my dad, a very paranoid guy after all this, works as an electrician at a government site. He's worked there since like the 90s, the same time as the infamous smiley face killer worked there. The killer also moonlighted as a long haul truck driver in the same building. My dad used to be a real happy-go-lucky party guy type, but this just changed all of that. On his first day, the killer, I don't remember the name so I'll just call him Dave, showed him around their shop and they became desk buddies. He began occasionally making strange comments that dad didn't think much of at the time, like pointing to a picture of my mum on his desk and saying, is that your wife? Yep, you all got a dog. Yeah, a big one named Gus. Pulls out a photo of the dog. Ah, okay. And that was it. But one day, the boss's daughter came in and he made some comment about how she was pretty, to which my dad replied, nah man, she's 16. Stuff like that. But nonetheless, my dad is a pretty nice guy and they would talk, and even left each other post-it notes in office breaks. A year-ish or so later, a serial killer hunt was making local news, where the killer actually left notes with a smiley face at the end. It was the talk of the valley. Dave began ending joke post-it notes he and my dad exchanged with a smiley face, which my dad told me to cut out because it was in poor taste. Then in 1995, Dave was arrested. He had actually killed eight women and only one had escaped with her life. This obviously shook my dad who became very protective over my mum who is a very fierce woman and she noticed, she's a psychologist. But a few years later when I was born, only a kid, my dad got a letter at his office from Dave in prison serving several life sentences while he was on paternity leave that his co-worker shredded before he could read it. He told him that he didn't need to know that he was already sleep deprived and worried enough with a newborn. He hadn't received any letters from Dave before this one, just years later, out of the blue, at my birth. So my entire life, my dad has always made me put trackers on my phone, text him when I'm out and carry pepper spray, not allowing me to have male friends at our home or be alone with grown men. And he never gets drunk unless he's at our house or at our neighbors. But he's happy. He plays his drums, spoils our cats, and jokes around a lot. However, every now and then he says that he thinks about that note, with whatever it said, showing up right when I was born. And he admits that it keeps him up at night. Since the moment that I started working at this restaurant six months ago, the alleyway behind the restaurant has always given me just an uncomfortable feeling. To gain a layout of this restaurant, it's located in the middle of downtown, five minutes from the Mexican-US border since we're located in the tip of Texas in Rio Grande Valley. The valley itself is not located right behind the establishment. You have to walk past its patio, then past our garage until you reach the side back door that you have to prop open as the door locks behind you once it's closed. But during the day, I'll usually see people just walking back and forth accessing the valley when I go to take out the trash and whatnot. It's typically a safe location, though it is also prominent for its homeless population. They're usually harmless, despite a few that are noticeably mentally ill. My colleagues have even gotten to know a few and have given leftovers whenever possible. I work as part of the kitchen staff at this restaurant and most of the time will work past 10pm. 
At night, my boss usually never lets the women take out the trash just to be safe. Especially a petite 5 foot Hispanic 28 year old female. But anyway, since the quarantine started our kitchen staff has become quite small. So I'll usually just help take out the trash with one of the other men working. And this night was pretty slow and my fellow co-workers and I were encouraged to clean up and leave early. At around quarter to ten I decided to get two of the slightly full trash bags and take them out back myself. Assuming someone will see my actions and take the other two after me. As I walked past the patio to the garage, my gut began to fluster a bit. I got to the back door and I just sort of paused. Maybe, maybe you should wait, I told myself. But the smell protruding from the bags was nauseating. I pushed the door and I propped it open with a brick that we usually kept nearby. The alley was dark and silent, but the air felt menacing that night. The only light illuminating was from the bulb above the door. I walked quickly to the bins and lifted up the top and dumped the trash. Then, slowly, a man stood up from the other side of the dumpster. He wasn't very big, but he looked a lot older. He was sweating, but his demeanor seemed agitated. Also, he must have been crouching there and waiting for some time. I jumped back, holding my hand above my heart that seemed to be pulsing through my chest now. The man looked at me, eyeing me as my steps moved backwards. He shook his head, motioning me to stop. He was far too close for me to outrun him, and I looked at his bushy dark brows and dark black eyes. Most of him was still cloaked in the night that surrounded us. His clothes didn't look homeless, but I still assumed that he was, since it's common for them to be out here at this hour, usually waiting for food. But I told him that I had no leftovers. He shook his head again though and took out a, a medium sized knife. And at that, my eyes widened as I took in a deep breath. The following exchange took place in Spanish, but uh, I'll translate. So I told him, listen, I, I don't have my purse. I, I was working. I I'm still working. Just come with me, he said using his knife as a pointer. My mouth grimaced. Having no idea where this small amount of courage came from, I said, My friend is coming right now with the rest of the trash. No, come now, he said more hurriedly and took a step closer and I stepped back again. Speaking again with a little more tenacity, They all saw me come over here. There's more trash and he's coming right now. He's outside right now. All I need to do is just yell. You're not going to scream. I'll gut you. To this day, I don't know what came over me, but I replied with, watch me. We looked at each other, daring each other. Then we both heard footsteps coming from inside the garage, and he ran past me. I stood there, breathing again. I didn't even know that I was holding my breath, but I turned to see my friend John come out the door. We're almost done over here, but he stopped after seeing my face. What happened? I explained everything as tears ran down my face. My friend decided to run down the alley to try and catch this guy, even though I told him not to and that he's gone by now. It was about five minutes until he came back, but John relayed to me that no one was around except for some homeless guys that we were familiar with. He asked them if they saw anyone running down the alleyway and they said yeah but they didn't recognize the man and he took off in the opposite direction towards the border. John took me back inside and told our boss what happened. They called the cops whose station was pretty close by. They sent someone to patrol the area and gather a description from me which I gave. My boss let me leave early and John walked me to my car that day. He told me that it's too bad that we don't have a camera back there. It would have been cool to see how I handled the guy. I sort of smiled slightly, but my stomach was still in knots. He looked at me and he apologized. I moved my hand to stop him and I told him that I'll be fine. And unfortunately, I still work there, but I've been excused from trash duty from now on. Obviously, they never found the guy too. I don't want to think about what would have happened to me if I was more complicit too. Something gave me the courage that night to argue back to him and thank goodness that my friend came out 
just in the nick of time. So a little bit of background story. I, a 24-year-old female, have been dating my boyfriend since I was 15. The first six years of our relationship have been kind of long distance. I used to go visit him on weekends though, and it would take me around two hours by bus or train to reach the station where he would come and pick me up. And this story takes place when I was 18, so I was quite used to public transportation by then, and I was aware of the creeps and the weirdos that one would encounter when traveling. Nothing really creepy had ever happened to me apart from the usual stares and unsolicited hello beautifuls. But one Saturday morning, I got on the usual train for the last 15 to 20 minutes of my trip after traveling for like one and a half hours by bus. I always tended to seat either close to other girls or to families with children. But this one time, the train carriage was pretty much empty, so I sat across from a, a young guy with flamingos on his t-shirt and a laptop. I don't really remember who the other people in our carriage were. That seat just looked like the safest one. Shortly after the departure, another guy entered the carriage and sat down next to me. He looked 25 to 30 years old if I had to guess. He was wearing some dirty old clothes and he smelt like sweat and maybe some booze or something. He said hi and I said hello back. As I said before though, I was quite used to weirdos talking to me on buses and trains, so I didn't immediately feel like I was in danger. In my experience, it was usually better to engage in a short and meaningless conversation than ignoring them completely. He asked what my name was and I made one up. Then he asked why I was traveling all alone and I said my boyfriend was waiting for me at the following station. I hoped that this would be enough to make him desist, but oh man, was I just so wrong. He started telling me that he had just gotten a new phone and he had lost all of his friends' numbers. He asked me to give him my number so that he'd have someone to talk to at night. <laughs> what the heck, right? But I just politely declined. At that point, I was starting to feel very uncomfortable though, I'll admit, but my stop was only like 5 or 10 minutes away and I still thought that he was going to give up and leave. He insisted on me giving my phone number and started getting closer to me though. And at this point... I sort of stopped answering his questions and looked in the opposite direction. This must have bothered him too because he suddenly put his dirty hand on my thigh to get my attention. I was immediately terrified but I managed to utter a shaky, don't touch me. I wished that I'd yelled that too but I didn't and no one in the carriage noticed what was going on. Not even the flamingo guy who was literally in front of us. Or maybe he did notice, but just didn't care at first. The guy, too, didn't take his hand off of me, and I was petrified. I don't remember if he said something else at that point, because I was so focused on his hand on my jeans. I gained some more courage, though, and managed to tell him to leave me alone in a slightly louder voice. I guess that some people started looking in our direction in that moment, because he suddenly got up and he left. I started crying in relief as soon as he exited the carriage. The flamingo guy asked if I was okay and if I needed him to call someone. I said that I was fine and I tried to call my boyfriend but he didn't answer because he was driving to come and pick me up. And at that point, I honestly thought that it was over. The train started slowing down and I got up in order to get off. Little did I know though that the creepy guy was probably keeping an eye on me from the window of the carriage door after he left. I got off the train though and started looking around hoping to see my boyfriend, who would sometimes wait for me on the platform. And at that point, I noticed that the guy had stepped off the train as well. As soon as we made eye contact, he started walking towards me, and I felt my heart drop. I turned around and started walking quickly towards the stairs, hoping that he would lose me in the crowd. As soon as I reached the underground corridor, I started running. I got to the other side of the tunnel, I ran up the stairs and towards the restrooms. I don't know why I didn't run to the main hall instead. I think I was just panicking and I just went for the first place that came to my mind. I locked myself in one of the cubicles, made sure that it was closed and then got up on the toilet so that he wouldn't see my feet. I was wearing a, a pair of quite recognizable boots. 20 or 30 seconds later, I heard someone come in 
and hastily try all of the door handles. Well, of course, it could have been anyone, but I'm convinced to this day that it was him. It just made no sense for anyone else to try to open all the doors like that, and I remember feeling my heartbeat in my throat while I was waiting for him to leave. I remained still and silent for what felt like ages until I finally heard him walk away. At that point, I just started crying again and finally managed to call my boyfriend and tell him that I was locked into one of the toilet stalls. When he got there, I came out of the stall and I was shaking uncontrollably, but he somehow managed to calm me down. When we got out of the restrooms, there was no sign of the guy and I never did see him again. Looking back now, I know that I should have reported him to the authorities, but I stupidly thought that they wouldn't believe me or that they were going to shrug it off as just not a big deal. After all, nothing really bad had happened on the train and I had no proof that it was him trying to open the stall doors. This experience made me avoid trains for quite a while too, and even though after some time I managed to overcome my fear, to this day I still get nervous on trains. I've been tempted to share this story for a while now. The following occurred on an island off of Washington State about uh, maybe seven years ago now. So my sister and her family moved from Oregon to Washington. I tagged along to check it out and it was different there. The woods in Oregon had a welcoming fantasy forest feeling whereas the woods of Washington felt ominous, forbidding especially at night. You could just really feel the woods out there, if that makes sense. Anyway, it was late afternoon and I was just chilling on the sofa at my sister's new place when she says that she found out about a trail on this island. It was already late afternoon, but we said, what the heck, let's go and check it out. Her husband wasn't up for it, but he agreed to drop us off and pick us up after. My oldest niece also decided to go with us. It's about 15 minutes away, so we grab a handful of things and off we went. Now, we were walking and talking, just enjoying the quiet. It was a simple trail, nothing special so far. But then we get to this enormous tree that must have been six feet around. It's in the middle of where the trail splits off in two directions, one that leads towards the seashore and one that leads further into the woods. So we decide that we're going to head towards the sea. We hang there for a bit, just sort of taking in the view and shooting the breeze before we start to head back. We get to the big tree and we decide to check out the other trail leading off into the woods. We're having a really nice time too. We have the trail entirely to ourselves and we're laughing and kidding around, enjoying each other's company and this nice day. And I don't remember who brought it up, but somehow Bigfoot comes up. Jokingly, I pick up a big stick and... I start whacking it against a random tree on the side of the trail and instantly about 20 yards off the trail before I'm even done with my second tap a huge loud wood wrapping sound begins hammering a tree fast too. Well, when I say fast I mean death metal blast beat fast and incredibly loud. Our heads all shoot in that direction but we can't see anything there though and suddenly it just stops. We all just sort of stand there startled. I think my niece said something about a woodpecker and we agree and we move on quickly. Now, from here on out, you might say that I'm making too much out of nothing or that we were idiots. But you just had to be there. You know the whole the woods went silent thing? Well, they were already quiet, but something had definitely shifted. The atmosphere had changed and... We weren't laughing anymore. It was just uneasy. But we kept going and slowly started relaxing and chatting again. But then, from somewhere up above us between the treetops, a sky monkey just started screaming. We froze. Everyone knows that sound. It's unmistakable. And it just rose higher and higher, like laughter moving closer and closer. And as it passes above us, it seamlessly morphs into a, a crow cawing. But the weirdest thing was that, although we followed the sound as it passed overhead, we didn't see a thing. 
We keep moving. No one is saying anything anymore, but we silently agree to move back towards the exit. We finish the loop that we're on and we head back in the direction of the big tree. But instead, we end up on a path that we don't recognize. I think you guys probably know where this is going, but we spent the next hour or so backtracking and pretending that there isn't a seat of panic in our guts. It's getting darker and the temperature is dropping quickly. We focus on the situation and try to keep our cool. When finally, up ahead, I see the big tree that we saw earlier and we are all relieved. As we're heading towards it though, we hear children. You know the sound of a big group of kids bursting out the school doors, sort of laughing? It was like that, headed towards the seashore. Honestly, I was relieved to hear other people. We ran the big tree and we started heading up the main trail towards the exit. My sister calls her husband and tells him to go ahead and come and get us. Up ahead of us is a bend and from around that bend comes two dogs. One big one and one little guy dragging leashes. They stand there just looking at us and as we approach the bend they both turn around and sort of go back. About 20 seconds later, we round that bend expecting to greet the owners and there's nothing there. No dogs, no people, it's a straight shot up to the exit from there, but there was no one. The sides of the trail are about 8 foot high I would guess and steep. There's nowhere anyone could have gone. But that's when I remembered the kids and it's getting dark soon so where are they and... Why would a crowd of kids be going to a random isolated seashore at this time of day? But then it occurs to me that we didn't hear any footsteps. And a, a crowd of kids would have made heaps of noise, especially moving at that speed. Also, there were no footprints of anyone but us. Her husband has by then shown up and is waiting with the engine running. We're almost there now, but... Right before we exit the gate, a powerful stench of something dead and rotting just hits me. I glance up to my left in the direction that it's coming from and I feel just a force of pure malevolence shoot right down my spine. Like nothing I have ever felt in my life up until that point and since then. Absolute passionate hatred aimed directly at me. My nose and my eyes are fixed to that spot now but... Again, there's just nothing there. We uh, quickly get into the car at this point and we pull away. And that was it. But I guess that that's the part that bothers me the most. Because none of us said a thing. As soon as we shut the doors, it was just like it never happened. We started talking about dinner and watching a movie and stuff. Like nothing had happened. In fact, I... I think it wasn't until later that night, alone looking at some snapshots that I took of the hike, that I started to piece it together. On a whim, I messaged my friend Joe, who is into weird stuff, and tell him a short version of the events. He never replied though, and so I just forgot about it and let it go. Over a few years and several phones, I never deleted that message though. It was like a, a blank spot where my memory of it should be. And I could only ever remember it clearly when I would reread it. Another strange thing too is that both my sister and I are into Bigfoot and the 411 stuff. But never once have we discussed it. I brought it up once a couple of years ago. Something like, remember that weird trail that we went on? Her only reply was, I'll never go on that trail again. And that was that. It just never came up ever again and I'll tell you that hearing a monkey scream in that forest was the most scared that I've ever been in my entire adult life but what sticks with me most was however at the end it was a hatred that I truly cannot describe just emanating like that stench accompanying it just absolute and total hatred directed straight at me but not my sister not my niece Whatever it was, it wanted me to know that it was me, that it despised me completely, 
that it would have been there at the finish line no matter what. So don't go stirring things up. You aren't and won't be in control. And like I said, scariest of all, it absolutely hates you. So myself and my partner rented our first house back in 2012. But nothing creepy or particularly off-putting about it. Just a, a standard terraced house on a street of identical houses in a northern town in England. But my partner, our wife, was pregnant at the time too, so we needed somewhere to bring up our first kid. We chose this one as it was in the area that we were familiar with and the rent was affordable. When we first moved in, everything was normal too. Just a standard house and we set about getting furnishings and all the usual stuff. I used to take my wife to work early in the morning and I'd drop her off and I would come back home. The front door opened directly into the living room and there was a sliding door from this room which went into the kitchen. This had a door going out the back to an enclosed yard shared with the nearby houses and the stairs were leading upstairs. There was also a frosted glass window next to the sliding door which was presumably once a serving hatch but now just served to let some natural light in as the sun never got to the front of the house due to the narrow street and surrounding houses. Now within a few weeks of moving in I developed a weird feeling like something was watching me through the window. It wasn't overpowering but it did get to the point whereby I would actively avoid looking at it out of the corner of my eye as some part of me was just always worried that I might see something on the other side looking back. I had always been deeply skeptical of anything paranormal so I always tried to ignore it or just laugh it off as me just being stupid in what was an unfamiliar house. That said though, the feeling became stronger to the point that after dropping my wife at work I would come home and catch a few hours on the sofa in the living room as I didn't want to go into the kitchen and up the stairs to bed. The feeling was definitely strongest though in the kitchen and on the stairs and the only way that I can really describe it is that it felt predatory. Like the constant nagging feeling that something was either watching you or right over your shoulder about to rush you even though there was nothing there. And things seriously escalated after one particular evening. So we were watching a Darren Brown TV show whereby he was disproving the idea of the paranormal and seances. Part of the show asked you to perform on a Ouija board at home and the premise was that he would lead the responses and tell you what results you would get. Thereby removing any idea of it being anything more than just suggestions and parlor trick. And my skeptical nature combined with my wife's belief in the paranormal meant that I was keen to go along with this to prove how her beliefs were just silly. Well, we started the Ouija board and went along with all the instructions. Except that we didn't get the results the show said that we should. But we got something far more sinister. When we asked for the name of any spirit, rather than the scripted name we were supposed to get, we got the name Ernest. By this point, I'm sort of laughing, thinking that my wife is pranking me and that Ernest is a stupid name to come up with. My wife isn't laughing, though, and says that we should stop. Thinking that it was all her, I go along with it. Do you like us living here, Ernest? The response was no. Why not, Ernest? What do you think of me? Rogue. Now, it's worth mentioning that this confused me. My only experience of the word rogue was as various classes in video games. So I said, okay, what do you think of my wife? Whore, it responded. Wife is getting more upset and by this point is really quite distressed. We follow the rules and say goodbye though. The glass that we were using as a planchette goes to goodbye. The board that we were using was made out of scraps of paper with letters and numbers and the usual yes, no, hello, goodbye on them. But as my wife was so freaked out by this, I collected them together, put them in a sort of glass bowl and took them out to the yard and burned them. Partly for her peace of mind, but I'll admit partly for my own too. So that night we had gone to bed and maybe around 20 or so minutes after we had got into bed, but we heard a loud bang that came from downstairs. I went downstairs to check everything, thinking that something may have fallen over. But everything was still in place, so I just went back to bed. As we lived in a terrace house, I told my wife that it might be the neighbors banging a cupboard door, and I eventually went to sleep. 
The next night we went to bed, within the first half hour of being in bed, the exact same bang came from downstairs. This happened every night, no matter what time we went to bed too, whether it was 9pm or 1am. Within half an hour we would always hear the same bang, always at least once, sometimes even twice. But we tried to replicate it and after trying everything, we discovered that a heavy cupboard door in the corner of the kitchen, when opened and then let go of, made the same exact noise. I was pretty intrigued by this and keen to find out what this was as we would never had any signs of pests or vermin and the cupboard was fixed to the wall about six foot off the ground so I asked my wife to let me set up a camera in the kitchen recording after we went to bed and whatnot. She wouldn't let me though as she said that she either didn't want to know or didn't want to antagonize it if it was anything and things really began to go downhill from here. We would find ourselves arguing over the smallest things, having full-blown shouting arguments for hours over nothing, despite normally being a very chilled out person, often accused of being too laid back, I found myself constantly on edge in a combination of what I can only describe as anger and anxiety. This didn't happen overnight obviously and was something that built up slowly with both of us, to the point I didn't notice it was happening until much later. There was no waking up a different person moment or anything, but just a slow and subtle change. And despite never having had before, I began suffering nightmares on a regular basis. I would have vivid dreams of family members dying in horrific ways such as being burned alive. I would wake up screaming or in tears and my wife would have to spend an hour reassuring me that they weren't real and calming me down as they just felt so real most disturbing though was she said that when she'd wake up and toss and turn due to being heavily pregnant and I'd lay there with my eyes wide open just staring blankly like I was asleep but with my eyes open and when she told me to close them I would with no other reaction or comment which is creepy right? I have absolutely no recollection of ever doing this and have never done this at any other point before or since living in that place. But the arguments continued and they got worse. The regular bang at night continued and the overall sense that something was following me, particularly in the kitchen and the stairwell, became more and more overpowering despite my best efforts to convince myself that I was being ridiculous and trying to force myself to walk slowly. I was clearing that flight of stairs like three steps at a time now, filled with adrenaline and my heart pounding in my ears. Strangely though, there was a, a brief lull in activity in the month or so before our child was born. It was around Christmas and the arguments had abated and we seemed to get back to ourselves. And quite honestly, I thought that we had turned a corner. I mean, the nightly bang persisted, but we'd become so used to it by now that we just looked at each other and rolled our eyes. My wife told me that the kitchen or the living room window and the sense of being watched or followed was something that she was experiencing too now. Then our little boy was born and everything was okay for the first week or so. But the atmosphere soon began to change. The sense of danger or anxiety began to creep back in and we started to bicker again. The atmosphere was also made worse as our new baby would just cry constantly every hour of the day when he was in the house. He would sleep for like 20 minute intervals and the rest of the time would be spent trying to nurse, wind, feed, distract, play, anything to try and soothe him but nothing ever seemed to work. But we had him back and forth to hospitals and doctors so many times in the first few months but inevitably when we got there he was calm and sleeping or gurgling happily. The doctors would look at us like we were crazy and I was beginning to think that I was cracking up myself. But when we got home, the crying would always begin again. We would take it in turns to see him at night, but this wasn't helped by the fact that I was now apparently doing the weird sleeping with the eyes open thing again. And it all culminated for me one night when I was laid in bed, waiting for the inevitable cry to start when... I saw a shadow form in the corner nearest the window and begin to slowly move across the fitted wardrobes that we had in the room. I initially thought that it was being created by the curtains against the headlights of a car moving slowly down the road, but it just wasn't moving right. 
The best comparison I can make is like that of ink being dropped into water. The room was dark to try and help our boy sleep, but this was much darker than the rest of the room. Like a, a very rich black and seemed to have shapes like smoky tendrils coming off of it. I laid and watched it as it inched along the cupboards and then watched it go around a corner and continue on the wall. I knew at this point that it wasn't a shadow, as a shadow would have jumped from the wardrobe to the wall, but not creep around a corner that was facing in the opposite direction to the window. I watched it go out the door and then onto the stairs. Now, if this was to happen now, I would have noped straight out of that room, but at the time I remember being oddly sort of mesmerized by it and only starting to feel any kind of fear after it left the room. I resolved not to tell my wife, as we'd already experienced enough weirdness to be on edge, and the idea that I may have just seen a manifestation would probably upset her even more. It was winter at this point though, and the house was constantly cold, not helped by how dark it was due to sunlight being unable to make its way in. No matter what we tried, we just couldn't get the place to maintain a constant comfortable temperature, one room may be red hot, but the next to the point of freezing, despite the heating being set to the same throughout the house. The rooms which experienced hot or cold varied from hour to hour as well. The temperature would spike in a room only to fall again to uncomfortably cold in the space of half an hour. But we had a room thermometer for our baby and we were having to constantly move from room to room to try and find one that was relatively normal. Unfortunately, I found the one place in the house where the temperature remained the most stable were the stairs and that landing. So I would always find myself having to sit there fighting the rising anxiety to run because it was the one room where our child could either not be overheating or wrapped in blankets against the cold. It was around this time too that I remember a dream quite clearly where I was talking with a woman, no idea who she was, and saying how dark and cold the house was. She asked me if I knew what that meant, and I said no. I remember even now when she said that life needs light to grow, that the only thing that can thrive in darkness is death. And I'll admit that it may have been my overactive paranoia or subconscious, but I clearly remember waking up with these words still in my head. Now, when I hear a lot of these stories, I often wonder why people didn't just get out of there. There's usually excuses about not wanting to surrender their home and fighting for their house and well this wasn't our house that we were renting and yeah, all the combined problems and the weirdness just got too much and so we decided that we just had to move. We found a house a few miles away and we gave our notice on the place and it was the night before we were due to move and in the early hours of the morning that we heard a piercing siren. We had a carbon monoxide alarm and it was going off. We opened all the doors and the windows and got outside. My wife and our boy went to my parents while I waited for the gas engineer. He arrived and immediately condemned the gas fire that we had in the living room which had started leaking carbon monoxide. And it's difficult not to think that without that alarm we could have all easily been dead. And the fact that it happened on the day that we were due to leave? I don't know. I just couldn't shake the idea that the two were linked and something either wanted us not to leave or to give us a parting gift. And if you've got this far, then well done. It's pretty long, I know, and I'd like to say that we moved and everything was better overnight, but it wasn't. The new house started out okay, but the nagging feeling of being followed around slowly crept back. Not as intense as before, but definitely noticeably there. In this house, we all shared a bedroom and had a lot of stuff still packed in boxes and generally cluttered in a spare room. One of them was a bouncer for our baby. It was a Fisher and Price frog type bouncer and had eyes on the front which, when rolled, would play a tune. And around 4am one morning, the frog tune just starts going off. I immediately looked to the crib next to our bed thinking that our baby might have got out somehow and started playing with it, but he was fast asleep. I did everything that I could to get it to go off again without spinning the eyes, knocking or hitting the floor around it. I tried to tell myself that it was maybe the batteries, but this was the only time that it ever happened, and 
We didn't have to change the batteries for like the next two years or so that we had it. After this too, the feeling of being watched grew, only now it was strongest from a conservatory on the back of the property. My wife and I had been through enough by this point that we now openly discussed the weird feelings with each other. There were a set of double doors between the kitchen and the conservatory and this one particular night my wife asked that I close them. I didn't ask why but did so and about an hour or so later I decided to go back for a cigarette. As I opened the doors the glass paneled French doors of the conservatory were in front of me. It was dark outside so all I could see in the doors were the reflections of the lit kitchen behind me. As I walked towards the doors I see in the reflection, very clearly, a black silhouette of a person run behind me, almost like it ran into the house through the exterior wall and straight through to the understairs. My first thought was that it was someone outside, but as I checked, no one was there. I stood there smoking and thinking and I realized that it couldn't have been outside as the figure passed behind and was briefly obscured by my own reflection, so... It had to have been in the room behind me. I quickly finished my cigarette and I went back inside. I sat there mulling it over before telling my wife the next day, to which she said that she had wanted the door shut as she hadn't felt comfortable about that room all day, more so than usual. We had a similar instance a month or so later which could have ended badly too, while driving and pulling onto the motorway, interstate for my American friends, a slip road, my wife all of a sudden jumped onto the brakes. When I asked what the heck she was doing, she said that a dark figure had just run in front of the car. There was literally no one around us at the slip road though, and it was in a wooded area away from any built up spots or paths. I didn't see it myself as I was in the back of the car with our boy, but my mother-in-law was in the front and... She said that she saw it too, and was equally spooked. Gradually since then, the feelings of anxiety and tension subsided though, thankfully, and we eventually moved again. Mirroring our experience of leaving the last place though, on the day that we were moving, we were taking our belongings down to the drive to a van when a roof tile slid off and narrowly missed hitting me or my brother-in-law, who was helping us. Thankfully, though, we moved to a house which, out of any, should have been the most haunted having been built earlier than the others in, like, the 1830s. This house, however, was the most tranquil and had no such weird atmospheres or happenings or any of that stuff. All of this was around, like, six to eight years ago now, and we often walk past the first house and have seen it come up for rent many times since then, so nobody seems to stay there long. But the funny thing is that we've both said a, a few times how when we see it on the market we both have a desire to go back. We even talked about going for a, a fake viewing just to walk around the place. We never have but even the idea that after everything we still feel an urge to go back to it is something which the rational part of my brain just can't really explain. I'm really tempted to go back through all of the old census records too to see if an Ernest ever lived in that house, but so far I've resisted the temptation to rake it all over for fear of setting something off again. That and me finding out that someone did, well, I really don't know if I would like that answer. Anyway, thanks for taking the time to get through all of this and listen to me. It's nice to get it off my chest and... I would love to hear from you guys if you've had anything similar, or if anyone can offer any explanation as to what all of this might have been.